You're an Islander FG, and welcome to Woke Hiring Won't Save Us, an actionable approach to diversity hiring and retention with Becca Lynch. While you're here today, please stop by the business hall in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside and Shoreline Ballrooms. The Black Hat Arsenal is also located there. If you'll please take a moment to go ahead and silence your phones for us, please. And with that, I'm going to give you Becca Lynch. If you can give us a round of applause to get us started. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thanks for being here bright and early. Day two, you made it. Um, we're here to talk about diversity, specifically gender diversity within our field. Like you said, my name's Becca. Um, I'm here from Duo Security out of Ann Arbor. We're part of Cisco. Uh, I also have my bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Michigan, and I'm currently a master's student in data science with the University of Illinois. So we're here to talk about diversity, specifically gender diversity, but I want to give a couple caveats of what this talk is not going to be about, right? This is not a talk about teaching girls to code. We're not going to get into how boys play with Legos and girls play with Barbies. Uh, this is a perfectly fine conversation to have, but it's beside the point, and we're going to see why. We're also really not going to talk about why you should hire more women, and this might seem counterintuitive. Um, but we're going to see that hiring alone is not the full story, right? And also, this is not going to be 25 minutes of blame and shame. I'm hoping that by the end of this, you'll all have an understanding of the breadth of the issue at hand, as well as clear, actionable steps that you can take to make our industry a better place. And one last caveat. Um, this is a talk about gender diversity, right? So that means we're not even going to be touching on issues of racial disparities, LGBT representation, and even within gender diversity, we can't really even have a conversation about non-binary and transgender people because there isn't even data on that. And that in and of itself is a big problem. So when we talk about diversity, when we talk about diversity hiring, we're usually talking about one moment. And that's the moment of making a hire, right? When companies say they have diversity initiatives, they're talking about hiring more people, right? Hitting some quota, bringing up some numbers. Um, this isn't the full story, and it's actually not solving much of anything, right? For starters, it's really hard to build a diverse workforce if we don't have the right building blocks. Uh, the rate of women graduating with degrees in computer science has been declining since the 80s. On the flip side, we can't have a conversation about hiring if we're not going to talk about attrition, right? Women in our field exit within 10 years at twice the rate of men. And there are all kinds of theories about why, right? We've seen the manifestos, we've heard conversations about intrinsic ability and biology, and I'm here to tell you, for lack of a better word, it's all complete bullshit. Uh, we're gonna see why. But first, let's talk about your team, right? There was a study with 1,400 participants across 21 different companies looking at how gender balance impacted the productivity of teams. And they found that overall, the closer that a team was to 50-50 gender balance, the more likely they were gonna be to experiment and innovate, to share knowledge among their team members, and most importantly, complete tasks on time, right? This matters. Uh, we hear this cliche a lot about diversity and how having a diverse team gives you diversity of thought. But what does this actually mean? Specifically, what does it mean for us in security? We talk a lot about risk here, right? There was a meta-analysis of 115 studies, all of which looking at how gender affected how people perceive risk. Found across the board, women perceive risks as higher than men in any given situation. They were more likely to enumerate specific risks, regardless of the situation. Even more interestingly, white men on average perceive risks than lower than any other demographic group surveyed, right? The more homogenous our teams are, the more similar we're going to think, and this matters when we're talking about really complex problems. Let's talk about the money. Uh, a study found last year that companies within the top quartile for gender diversity were going to be 15% more likely to have returns above the industry medians. Moreover, turnover is really expensive, right? A study from the Kapoor Center for Social Impact last year found that unfairness was cited as the number one reason for leaving tech jobs. 37% of people who left their tech job said that they left because of unfair treatment. It was the main factor in their decision. Of those who left due to unfairness, 35% were less likely to recommend the company as a good place to work, and 25% less likely to recommend the product itself. This is personal. Um, but what does this have to do with diversity? The study broke up unfairness into several key 
behaviors, and these are five of them here. We see rudeness and condescension, poor management, others taking credit for your work, your coworkers being less educated, and assumptions being made about your skill level. And they found that every single one of these instances, women were significantly more likely to have these experiences working in tech, right? Regardless of our initiatives, regardless of our quotas, these are the lived experiences of people in our industry every day. And it's really expensive. Um, this study from their most conservative estimate said that the annual cost due to turnover related to unfairness at tech companies alone annually, $16 billion, because we don't know how to treat each other, right? We're gonna get into, we're gonna get into what this looks like in day-to-day -day interactions, how we can go about approaching it, what this really means, but first, I wanna take it back to building the workforce, right? How do we build a diverse team? And this is kind of commonly referred to as the pipeline problem, right? Well, there just aren't women to hire. There's no women applying, so there's nothing I can do. Uh, it turns out there is a lot you can do, and it also turns out that it was not always this way. Uh, the percent of women graduating with computer science degrees peaked in 1984 at 37%. It's been decreasing ever since. For the last several years, it's been stagnant at just about 18% nationally, and we're one of the only disciplines to see this decline, right? Degrees like mechanical, biomedical, environmental, civil engineering have all seen increases in the rate of women graduating with these degrees. I wanna take a look at my alma mater in particular. There's a really popular computer science course, Introduction to Programming. It has about 1,000 students every single semester. 40% um, of them were women in 2016. The program overall was only 21% women including this massive course. Graduation rate was even lower. What's happening? Where are they going? Um, so there was a longitudinal study that looked at women from the moment that they entered a computer science program to the moment they graduated, whether or not they stayed, right? It found that the attrition level was the highest between the first and second year. And this makes sense, right? This is when people figure out what they like, what they don't like. Um, but this actually wasn't the case. The majority of women leaving programs in computer science were leaving because they didn't feel confident in themselves. They cited low confidence as the main reason. And they cited low confidence regardless of their actual skill levels and abilities. They cited low confidence regardless of whether they were actually performing at the same level as their peers. The same study, maybe unsurprisingly, found that men and women entering these programs had very different levels of prior experience. But this didn't really matter. In fact, they found that prior experience was not a significant predictor of success in a four-year program. It didn't matter. So what do we do? <laughs> um, there was one study a few years back that proposed a solution, and they said, well, men and women, maybe they just learn differently. Right? Maybe we should teach them differently. Maybe we'll have one class for the boys, and they're gonna learn programming and all that boring stuff, right? And then the girls are gonna have a class where they learn how to program apps for shopping. <laughs> Um, this did not work. It increased levels of isolation. It actually increased the rate of attrition within the program. Turns out people don't like to feel different. They don't like to feel isolated. So what do we do? Um, I wanna look at one institution in particular that's doing a lot of things right. Carnegie Mellon has taken a very intentional approach to retaining and keeping really smart, passionate young women who are interested in the field. And their approach has three key points. Building a community within the university, making sure that anyone who's ready to work hard has people in their corner, has people that they can go to, and being intentional about building this community. Emphasizing that there is no experience necessary, that it is not a barrier to success in this program, and that's proven. And last, providing visibility into different pathways in the field, showing young women this is what success looks like. These are role models that you can have this is who you can be, and this industry is for you. So what does this actually look like? Um, they have an organization called Women at SES, School in Computer Science. It looks like outreach that promotes the different pathways into the field, including security. It looks like publishing interviews with successful women within the field, connecting students with alumni that are successful in their careers, opportunities in the community like workshops, panels, outreach events, Internal conferences where women in the program can come together and talk about their work. Corporate sponsorships and interviews with faculty to show that there's more than one way to be successful in this industry. And here are the people who are making that possible. 
And the results speak for themselves. In eight years, um, Carnegie Mellon saw the percent of women enrolling in their computer science program go from 25% to 50%. 50%. In just three years, the percent of women graduating with computer science degrees rose by 7%. This doesn't sound like a whole lot, right? 7% in just three years. When you consider that the national average only rose by 0.5% in those same three years, they're doing something right. The caveat here is that this only works if all of us show up, right? When we participate in our community, when we show up for one another, we're sending a message to everyone who's ready to work hard, regardless of their gender, that this industry is for everyone. So we've solved it, right? <laughs> we're gonna hire an amazing workforce, they're gonna be great, we're gonna encourage women in tech, it's gonna be amazing. Turns out we cannot have a conversation about diversity hiring if we're not going to have a conversation about the rate at which women are leaving our industry. So what we see here is from a study of 13,000 men and women in both STEM and non-STEM jobs. This is the survival rate for women depending on their industry. Um, we see non-STEM in the blue, STEM in the yellow. And the survival rate in the industry means what percent of women remained in the industry over the tenure of their career. Not at their job, not at their company, the industry itself, right? Non-STEM roles saw a retention rate of about 90% over 20 years. For STEM, it was just below 40%. The steepest cutoff was at 10 years, where they saw an attrition rate of 41%. 41% of women who pursued education, who pursued training, who entered the field, left after 10 years. This is double the rate of their male colleagues. So what's happening? Why are they leaving? The same survey found that 82% of them said that they love their work. Women in STEM, they love their work. 100% found it intellectually challenging, stimulating, and interesting. So why leave? Where are they going? Of the women in STEM who left, 77% said that they cited either extreme pressure or a hostile, macho culture as their reason for leaving. And I don't know about you, my workplace does not exactly look like the WWE, right? There's no one lifting weights at their desk or pounding protein shakes. So what's so macho about tech? What does this mean? What's happening? And it turns out it's really subtle. Um, it gets into how we interact with one another on a day-to-day -day basis. It gets into how do we treat each other? How do we talk to one another? Small things add up and turn out to make a really big difference. We're gonna talk first about implicit bias. What does this look like? What does it mean? How can we approach it effectively? So implicit bias, as you can maybe gather from the name, uh, it's not explicit. It's implicit, which means it's not sexism or racism. Uh, it's unconscious product of learned behavior. It's things that are ingrained in who we are. We all have it, right? It's really difficult to acknowledge. It's not intentional, and this is key. It's not malicious. It's ingrained in who we are. It's very difficult to overcome, and it's developed simply by virtue of living in the world that we live in. And lastly, it's not fixed by blame and shame. It's not fixed through lecturing and calling out one another, right? It's fixed through empathetic conversations and thoughtful, productive dialogues, right? And I'm not a psychologist, so I cannot teach you how to have empathy, but we're gonna go over a few examples of what this might look like. So in action, right, it's small things, it's little things. Like using male pronouns to describe a male or a, a potential client or a potential new hire, right? How many of you have done this? I have done this, I do this all the time. Crediting an idea to someone else, this is super easy to do when we can't acknowledge how our bias influences our own decisions. Underestimating others' abilities and making assumptions about their roles. This is like when a new hire came up to me at an event and asked if I worked in marketing. It's not intentional, he didn't mean to be mean about it, right? But it matters. Think back to this graph. The behaviors that people experience that cause them to leave their industry to leave their jobs in tech. Rudeness, condescension, miscrediting work, understanding, underestimating someone's abilities, right? All our lived experiences of bias, all proven to drive talented people away from the field, and all experienced significantly more by women than by men. So what does this look like? We're gonna imagine a scenario, you've gone out to lunch with one of your coworkers, and you start to discuss a new colleague on your team. Your coworker says something like this. She seems kind of aggressive. All right, this is a loaded statement. We're not even gonna get into 
what this really means, the gender dynamics of all this, because it's kind of irrelevant. The key here is to maintain assumptions of positive intent, right? This does not mean lecturing or calling out your colleague, putting them on the defensive, and giving them the ability to shut down the conversation, right? Well, no, I'm not sexist. Why would you say that? You want to leave room for a dialogue. Assume positive intent. This is a key part of our culture at Duo, where I work. What does this look like? It means asking questions, right? Getting them to nail down specific actions, right? What makes you say that? This gives them room to point out specific things that cause them to feel the way that they feel. And you might find that in having this conversation, they'll reevaluate their own perspective. Same scenario, different colleague says something like this. She's very articulate. <laughs> Both of these are things that I've heard about women that I work with. She's very articulate. And on face value, this seems like it's kind of maybe supposed to be a compliment, right? She's articulate. What does this mean? It means she can speak in sentences. <laughs> it's kind of a given, right? How do we have a conversation about this that doesn't put our colleagues on the defensive? This is a point where private feedback is going to be key. We don't want to give them room to end the conversation similarly. Frame the feedback within the context of your own perception. Feel that by saying that, you might imply that you assumed otherwise. This is wordy, you don't have to say it like this. The key is that you're framing it within the context of your own emotions, about her experience, about your coworker's experience. This isn't really accusatory, and what it does is it doesn't give them room to make excuses. Oh, that's not what I meant. It's irrelevant. This is how someone perceived it, and that matters. Another threat to retention of women in tech, particularly, is this thing called stereotype threat. So anytime that you are an underrepresented group within some larger organization, some larger field, right? There are typically negative stereotypes about your performance, your abilities, and these affect us, right? Stereotype threat is the fear that one will fall into existing negative stereotypes about yourself, about your people. It increases anxiety, and it's been proven to decrease productivity and performance, right? And this is really hard to address. How do we change how people feel about themselves, right? It can start with increasing the visibility of men and women from different backgrounds within all levels of your organization, if you can, right? Highlighting the talent that you have, showing people, here is someone who is successful, here is someone who has made it, here is proof that you can too, and you can do it here. Convey your high value of diversity, right? We've seen the proven benefits of having a diverse team. Show that this is something that you believe in and that you're committed to and be vocal about it. Convey high standards and frame feedback within the context of these high standards. This seems counterintuitive, right? We're talking about people who underestimate themselves, right? We don't want to make that worse. This means framing feedback within the context of your own high standards. It's not, I have high standards and you're not going to live up to them. It's, I have high standards and that's why I hired you. That's why I want to work with you. That's why I know that you can do the job. And last, one of the most proven, impactful methods of retaining smart women in your organization is sponsorship. It's similar to mentorship. There are a few key differences. A mentor is someone who provides tips and advice about your day-to-day. -day. A sponsor is someone who provides public and private advocacy for you within the organization. A mentor is going to be someone who increases your confidence, your competence. These are all great things, right? A sponsor is someone who enables your career advancement and visibility within the organization. They're going to make sure you're working on the right work and that your work is seen by the right people. And last, a mentorship is a relationship that's generally formed by the request of the mentee or through some formal program like an internship, an onboarding process, things like that. Sponsorship is a relationship that's formed by the efforts of the sponsor. Right? This is someone who goes out of their way to take organic, effective actions to form a relationship, to stand up for their coworkers. So what does this look like in action? A mentor might be someone who goes to their colleague and says, I know you should work on X, and I'll help you get set up. I have this project. I'm going to help you do it. A mentor is going to be someone with connections. They're going to go to their peers. They're going to go to people above them and say, I hear you have a project. I know someone who would be great, and here's why. I hear you want to send people to Black Hat. You should send this person. Here's why. 
I hear you want someone to speak at the next team meeting. I know who should do it, right? They're in your corner. And this is proven to work. The value speaks for itself. When we see data on sponsored versus unsponsored women, sponsored women were more likely to report a satisfactory pace in promotions. They were more likely to ask for high visibility work. And perhaps most strikingly, mothers who were sponsored were over 25% more likely to stay with their employer than mothers who were unsponsored. And this makes sense, right? You know you have someone that's going to go to bat for you. It's going to promote your work. It's going to connect you to the right people. So we've covered a lot of ground, right? This is a huge, complicated problem. But hopefully now you see that this is more than hiring. This is more than the pipeline, right? This comes down to how we treat each other and how the things we say impact everyone, right? But it's not hopeless. There's a lot that you can do. It starts with getting involved at a local university, college programs that support and encourage women and diversity at all levels. Participating in local workshops that promote diversity. Not only is this great for visibility for young women, it's also kind of selfish if you want to hire some really great people. Within your organization, it means visibly supporting diversity initiatives and being a spokesperson, being vocal about the proven benefits of a diverse team. We've seen that it works. Recognizing and addressing your own bias in your work environment. Being willing to think inward before you speak. Being willing to have tough conversations with your colleagues. Being willing to understand how the things we say and do impact the people that we work with. And last, advocating and supporting one another through efforts like sponsorship, right? Going to bat for our colleagues, making sure that everyone knows that they have people in their corner and that women who want to come to this industry have space to stay and succeed and they have that space with you. This is a really complicated problem, but the solutions are simple. They come down to empathy, to understanding, and to showing up for one another. Thank you.